KIXI Radio. With over 350 graphics and videos posted on YouTube, 38,000 viewers have seen his message and he is now considered a leading authority in gratitude and how living the life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. So ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome David George Burke, that gratitude guy. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie, and uh, thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me. I've had the opportunity to speak up here a couple of times, and for some reason, I have such profound respect for people that put on events like this, and whether it's a small crowd, I've spoken to 10 or 12 people up to a couple of thousand, and it never makes any difference to me because if there's one person there, it's worth it if one person can hear a message. And for some reason, I'm not sure this is even completely appropriate, but it kind of reminds me when I asked, invited a friend over for dinner once, and I said, would you like to come over for dinner? And he said, what are you having? And I said, well, not you anymore. If you, if you care what we have, for crying out loud, it's like, gosh, oh, with spare ribs, I'll be right there. Oh, spaghetti, forget it. Um, so let me just start out with, um, I have a, a message that I feel very, very strongly about. And as I said, whether there's 500, 1,000, or one person, it makes no difference to me. But let me ask this question. How many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life by show of hands? Thank you. Again, regardless of size, it's always about 75, 80, 90 percent, somewhere in that neighborhood. It's a large, large number. And the reason why it's so important to me is I start off by talking about the most significant day in my life with a personal loss, and it was September 29th, 1998. It was 15 years ago last Sunday. And as I went through the anniversary last week, I made it about halfway through the day, and then later in the day, it was a very, very difficult day. But what had happened is a Tuesday back in 1998 on the 29th of September, and I woke up, and I looked over in bed, and I couldn't find my wife. I thought, that's strange. I wonder where Dana is. And then just then, Connor, my four-year-old, comes in and says, where's mom? I, went, I don't know. Let's find her. So I get out of bed and we walk down the hallway. Kyle, my 14-year-old, comes in and says, where's mom? Same question. I don't know. So we look in a couple of rooms and we walk down. We look downstairs and in front of the washer and dryer, she is face down. And she's sort of hunched over and curled over. It doesn't look good. So I go running down there and I turn her over and there's this sort of stuff coming out of her mouth and things. And Connor starts crying and I yelled to Kyle. I said, go call the police, call the fire. And within a matter of about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe less, there's probably 25 people in our house. You know, just like one of those shows on TV and there's wires and tubes and paddles and they're doing the electric shock thing and their chest is bumping up in the air. And, and again, it's why I always ask if people have gone through traumas because uh, people always come up to me afterwards. And I had a chance to talk to Michael before uh, we got started today and hearing something about his story and I met Charlie before and, and it's just interesting to hear people's stories and how they process things. Well for those of you that have been through something like this it's been traumatic one thing I will tell you that happens is that time loses all measure and I wasn't sure how much time had passed but this little short fire person comes over to me and says Mr. Brooke we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half we still don't have a heartbeat would you like us to continue? And even when you're in shock, the brain still manages to process things. And I said, um, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She was 38 years old. And I remember thinking later that day, I don't think I'd ever made a life and death decision for anybody in my life. And here I was making that decision for Dana. But what had made it so particularly compelling for me is that wasn't the first thing that had happened to me. Earlier in my life, my mom and dad had gotten divorced and then my mom got cancer and she unfortunately passed away. And I was at a pretty young age, I was in my 20s. And then my father, a pretty uh, prominent attorney in Seattle, uh, decided to end his life one day. And it just went on and on and on. And I remember thinking, this is why I'm so passionate about this message of gratitude. How am I going to cope with this? And again, no matter how many people, I cannot emphasize that enough, I get to talk to, tell me these stories. And the very first thing, I might even said this to Michael and he and I were chatting. What did you do? How'd you cope with it? What trick did you, what tool did you use? What saved you? What helped you? And so I remember a couple of days later walking up on the deck 
And I was still in the days after Dana's death. And I started kind of pinching my skin and I just went, I'm just a human being. I'm just a little guy here, bone and cartilage. I don't know if I can do this. And for the first time ever, it made me realize why people kill themselves. But I thought, I'm not going to do that. And that is off the table. Here's Connor, as I mentioned, four, and here's Kyle, 14. I'm just not going to do that. So that's not a decision anymore. So along the way, it also occurred to me, it all depends on how you look at something. You have to decide. Some of you have glasses of wine or water, and it's like glass half full and that type of thing. But just to illustrate the point, I'd like you to all stand up, if you would, for a second. And I just want to have you do something for a sec. Nothing big. A little audience participation, but nothing fancy. Take your right arm, put it up in the uh, air, and turn it in a clockwise manner. Now, there is a clock there. Oh, I don't have a clock on. But there's a clock there. But this is a clockwise manner. We're all digital now. So, so keep it going. Keep it going clockwise. And just start to slowly bring it down. Keep it going clockwise and bring it down to your eyes, your chin, your chest, maybe your waist. Now what direction is it going? Counterclockwise. Counter Thank you, Michael. <laughs> okay, you can sit down. So there's always a few people there. Did, did I switch? Did I start going the opposite direction? I have a good friend that um, he's actually a master's or a PhD. I don't know, he has so many degrees, I can't. But he actually came to one of my talks and said, so what's the story on that circle thing? I said, what do you mean, what's the story? He says, the people change midstream. I said, no. You look at it from the top, you look at it from the bottom. It just depends on how you look at it. Oh, okay, I thought it was something special. <laughs> so, I said, that's fine. But it's just my way of saying you have a choice. A lot of times when I do workshops, I talk about a T in the road. And you can't go straight anymore. You've got to go left or right. Left is my way with gratitude and embracing gratitude and, and seeing the good in your life. And right is the way you've been doing it. If you want to stay going that direction, that's fine. But I can't help you. But I realize it takes as long as it takes. When I was 19 years old, I wanted to be a speaker. I graduated from high school and I went to the University of Washington and a teacher called me back and he said, I'd like you to speak to my class. Why me? I don't know, I think you're going to be successful. Which is uh, kind of a dubious. <laughs> I don't know if that's been true or not. But I came back and I spoke to his class and I remember being all nervous and Marie was talking about listening to a speaker and people get nervous, I had to have a glass of water. And... But I really thought, I want to be a speaker someday, but I never knew what it was going to be. So it took me 45 years to decide what I was going to talk about. Now I am 63 years old. I know you're thinking he doesn't look a day over 62, but it's gone by fast, but it doesn't matter. But one of the things I think people have to realize, and I, and I actually I think I mentioned this to Charlie as well, all I'm trying to tell people is I've got an alternative out here for you, and it's called gratitude, and it's called the gratitude journal. And we're all looking for ways to cope. But you have to remember, it takes as long as it takes. And I have a ton of examples, but I'll just tell you one. So Connor was four when Dana died. So you can imagine how that must have been for him. What's happened? He was right there when, she, when he saw her take her last breath or she was dead. So it was a challenge. So I had him in kindergarten and they said, you know, your son has got real problems. We need to have him do an assessment. We've got to put him through all these different tests and things. So I remember the day we did it. He was about four and a half because he was just a little over four when Dana passed away. So after it was all over, they said, go have him wait in the car. And I came in and went into the office. And she reads the thing and tells me everything that's wrong with him. He's really messed up. I said, his mom just died a few months ago. What do you expect? Well, whatever. That's the way she was. She said, uh, he's going to need all sorts of occupational therapy and extra special treatment and everything. And I'm just, I can barely keep it together. I had fraternity brothers tell me I wasn't the same for four or five years after Dana died. So it's, it's a journey, and you've got to get your way back. So I went back into the car, and well, actually, before I went back to the car, we lived by Green Lake in Seattle, and I said, well, you know, Mrs. whatever your name was, I said, I think Connor's going to be the starting quarterback at Roosevelt High School. I was a pretty decent athlete. And she goes, <laughs> no. And I never forgot that. She started laughing. He's not going to be any athlete. He's not going to have any success at all. You're going to have a very, very difficult time with him. So I went back, got in the car, and I just burst into tears and couldn't stop crying. Connor kept going, Daddy, what's wrong? Why are you crying? 
I couldn't stop. I probably cried for 10 minutes or so. I couldn't tell him. For years, I didn't even tell him what happened to Dana. Dana had died of a prescription pill overdose. She got hooked on Vicodin, Oxycontin, got worse and worse. I'd never seen a person arrested before in my life. She got arrested for prescription fraud. And she goes into this treatment center in Everett, Everett, Providence. And Dr. Dickinson calls me in one day and he said, are you David Brook? Are you Dana's husband? I said, yeah. Well, I need to let you know what you're up against. See all those people over there? And they show the people that are the ones that are in recovery. They're going through the treatment. And they make you feel better by saying, he's a policeman, they're a fire person, that's an architect or something. And that's fine. I said, that's, I understand that. But all I care about is the blonde gal there. That's Dana. That's my wife. He goes, well, I've been doing this for 35 years. One in 20 is all. We'll make it back to a normal life. One. And of the 19 that don't, Half of them will be dead in the next six months. And Dana died about six months later. So they know what they're talking about, and it's tough. But I realize that you got to hang in there. And again, it doesn't matter what the burden is, what the, the part that you're carrying on your shoulders. And I'll get to this in just a second, because this is what the key part of what I talk about, is how gratitude, in a particular gratitude journal, can save you and change you and take you back from some of the depths that I've heard that are just unbelievable what people have gone through. So Connor wanted to play baseball and he wasn't very good. And I remember thinking through time, maybe that lady was right. As rude as she was, maybe she was right. So he does coach pitch. How many people here have kids? Again, see, almost it's always about 80, 90%. Double hands, I even like that too. So he gets to t-ball now, I'm sorry, he can't, he doesn't hit the ball. He hits above the ball. I go, no, Connor, hit the ball. And then he hits the tee and the ball dribbles forward. He goes, I got a hit. I go, no, Connor, you have to hit the ball. And this is how it works. And he's swinging up here. And we went through all these stages. And I started thinking maybe she's right. And then we get to May 31st, 2005. He's like nine years old, 10 years old. And there's a game, and it's the bottom of the seventh, and he hasn't been able to hit, throw, catch, run, anything. He just can't. He'd go in the dugout and put his hands in his face and just cry because he couldn't hit anything. He couldn't, you know, if he was lucky, he'd get hit by a pitch. But it's the bottom of the seventh, and there's guys on second and third, and they're down seven to six, and there's two out. Guess who comes walking out of the dugout? So I look over, oh, goodness. And here comes Connor. He's smiling, he waves to me in the stands. You know, usually they don't look at their parents. It's like waving to me. I go, don't just pretend I'm not here. He gets up to bat. And as he gets up to bat, I, of course, do what only thing seems logical. How about a walk? Maybe another hit by a pitch. I'm hoping for anything. Ball one, strike one, ball two, it's full count. Next pitch comes whipping in, and he just rips it down the third baseline, goes just inside the bag, in the left field. The guy comes in from third, the guy from around second comes in, the ball, the guy, the catcher, they all come to the catcher, catches the ball, they all crash together, and the ball pops out. And they went eight to seven. So guess who's standing out on second base? All by himself. The entire dugout goes out and carries him off the field on their shoulders. I am telling you, I, even to this day, I still have a hard time telling that story because I had such a lump in my throat. But when we came home that night, I sat him down on the, uh, the bed and I said, Connor, it was never about baseball. It's about the fact that he never gave up. And he never did give up. He just graduated last year. I had to hold him back, so he's 19. Now this is, you're not gonna be able to see this very well, but. There's his graduating picture. He's six foot two. And this year, the year he graduated last year, he was a starting pitcher at Bothell High School on their team. Oh, thank you. You're getting a book just for being the first person that started to clap right there. What is your name? Mary. Mary, thank you, Mary. Did you see that? The minute I said starting pitcher, I just go, this, this is yours because I can't, I can't collect. Thank you. 
So, but, but the thing is, is I realized that. So now I had a friend of mine say, you know what, you're struggling. You're having a tough time. And this is really what I want to spend the majority of my time that's left about. Is you need to get a gratitude journal. He's a very good friend of mine. Now, how many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal, truthfully? Okay, a few hands. Cool. How many have ever heard of a journal? How many have ever seen a journal? Yes, okay, that's everybody. Thank you. Well, I had never seen a gratitude journal. I'd never heard of it. What's that? Well, you write what you're grateful for. What's the point of that? It was, well, you're struggling, and if you think about, you're wondering how you're going to cope in life, let me tell you, this will help you. So I get this gratitude journal. I order it. I get it from Amazon. I get one that has a little magnetic closure on it. And I just put it on the shelf and don't touch it for three months. I don't understand why I did that. A lot of people do that. They order it, and they just don't do anything with it. But then I started writing in it. And I noticed how everything started to change because it totally refocuses you on everything you're grateful for in your life and everything you have versus what you don't have. All you have to do, I know they get a ton of blame, all you have to do is turn on the paper, turn on the paper, read the paper, turn on the TV, turn on the radio. It's always about, there was a shooting. And this is what really got me. I walked by the TV one day and they said, there's been a shooting in West Seattle. Now stay tuned as more details become available. And I'm thinking, why would I care about more details? What caliber of the bullet was? Does that really matter to me? I thought, what are you doing? Why are you even paying attention to this? So I started focusing on all this positive. And then I made my own journal. The Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And I sell a lot of these, but I tell people, you can buy mine. You can get them online at thebrooker.com, all this. But that's not the point. The point is, do something, affirmations, journaling, gratitude journal, something that helps you focus on everything in your life that you're thankful for. I've met a lot of people. I was telling, I think, Donna and Charlie and Michael, perhaps, that uh, I used to do, I was managing the lows over here in Mount Vernon. And I decided to get out of the corporate world. I'm going to do this full time, and I would do one or two talks a week. And now I do two or three, or one or two talks a month. And now I do two or three or sometimes four a week. And I feel like the most blessed, most fortunate person around if I can make a difference in one person's life. But what happened on this, I told people, if you write about it, it's like, a, if you think about it, excuse me, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. It's like a thought here. I'm so grateful Jennifer invited me. I'm so grateful I had a chance to reconnect with Charlie. Anything that you think about goes from your brain to your heart to your arm to the pen to the paper and you write it down and you can go back and refer to it and see it and so on and so forth. So it makes a huge, huge difference. So I like to do, when I do workshops, I do this with a piece of paper. There's no more standing up, so don't get freaked out. Um, but I want you to do something for me. I want to just do a little test here. So one of the things I talk about, the structure of this gratitude journal, and then, of course, this is another thing I love. There's Connor's picture. This is my journal. Here's today, Saturday, the, the uh, 5th. So people see it and they flip through. They go, oh, you're writing that every day. I, I hope so. I'm up here talking about this. Do you think I just write in it occasionally? I say, you have to write in this every day. It takes seven and a half minutes. But there's the day and the date and the daily number, which we're going to talk about in a second. A couple of lines on what's happening in your life, current events. That's so you don't need another journal or diary. And then what you're grateful for today, the highlight of your day, and on the right-hand side is what you're going to be grateful for tomorrow. That's what's known as your gratitude intentions. The subconscious mind cannot distinguish between what you think is going to happen and what actually happens. And that's why you can program your brain to be grateful for something that hasn't even happened yet. So daily number, 1 to 10. 10 is one of the best days of your life, and 1 is one of the worst days of your life. So I want you to all think about, I'm not going to make anybody say their numbers or anything. I just want you to think about what your number is today. No halves. One through ten. Ten is the best, one is the worst. Okay, so has everybody got their number in their head? So if you're a one to five, don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I'd like to see by a show of hands, do we have any sixes? Okay, one. any sevens? A few more. Any eights? few more. Nines? One. And any tens? Two. Fantastic. Mary, and what's your name? Susan. Susan. Mary and Susan. Thank you. Okay. 
So now I want you to reprogram your brain for a second. I want you to think about the most important thing in your life that you have that you're grateful for. You don't have to tell anybody. I'm not going to give you any hints. I know what they are for me. But I want you to think about the thing in your life you are the most grateful for. Just plan it right there. Okay? And now you've got that there. Now I want you to think of the second most important thing you have in your life that you're grateful for. So now you've got two things. And then I'm going to ask you to add one last thing. What was the highlight of your day today? Now it's about... 6 or 6.30, something like that. So we've had a day that's gone by. I want you to think about what was the best thing that happened to you today? And if you can't think of today, think of yesterday. So you got those three things. Best thing you're most grateful for, second most grateful, and what the highlight of your day was. So plant those in your mind, okay? Now I want to try this again. One to five, don't raise your hand. How many sixes now? Okay, how many sevens? One, couple. How many eights? A few more. How many nines? Much better. And how many tens? I'm going to give all of you three 20 bucks just for, just for making my little exercise look good. What's your name? Jim. Jim. Susan, Mary, and Jim. I'm actually, people go, where's my 20? After the thing's over. I'm looking at your books now. Where's my 20? I'm just trying to prove my point. I do that on paper. And it's even more powerful because you're writing it down and I spend a little more time, but depending on the size of the group and I don't know if it's time to have time to pass out paper. But I just try to illustrate it's that amazing, this power. And when you're writing down, the highlight of my day so often lately has been talking to Connor because Connor went to school. I think I was telling Donna this. Uh, Connor left for school and went to San Diego. And it has been very, very difficult for yours truly because he and I were very close and he was the younger of the two, of course. And it made a huge, huge difference for me to write in this journal every day about how grateful I am for having Connor and have him do it, have him having been doing, I'll get it, so well since Dana passed away and all the things. So, so here's what I want you to think about. Embracing gratitude. I get, I'm fortunate enough to do some TV shows and radio and things like this and there. One of the things they always say is, what, what's the one thing you want us to take away from this? And I said, well, just get a gratitude journal. Let's give it a try. I know people say, here, have a drink, pop a pill, snort that junk. But I tell them, give it a try. You watch what will happen to you. It's a very personal thing. I, have, I, I get to these workshops and a lot longer talks. I go into detail about some other things that have happened. Just to prove a point. And I feel so strongly about as I stand up in front of groups. I'm not teaching out of some book. These shoes have walked through this where I really wondered if I was going to make it. So I'm not just saying, well, it's, it doesn't, I don't know how it feels for me, but it can work for you guys and gals. But it does. You embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. Understand you have to never, ever, ever give up. I believe that was Winston Churchill. Get a gratitude journal. Use it. Try it. You'll be amazed how it'll change you. And lastly, share gratitude. Things aren't the same when we don't share them. One day I was, and this is a little personal, but I was up at Burlington, not far from here, a little north of here doing a talk, and I woke up that morning, and I was like a three. And my mom, that, as I said, died of cancer, had uh, manic depressive disorder, later diagnosed as bipolar, and I think I got some of that depressive stuff from her. I'm the gratitude guy. I can't be depressed. Man. And, but I was about a three. I thought, I'm in trouble today. I got to talk later this afternoon. So I went to Starbucks, took my gratitude journal, wrote it, and I think it bumped me up to about a five or a six. It really helped. I didn't even take a shower. I just went down there and wrote it as quick as I could. Came up to Burlington. About 200 people at the Chamber of Commerce. I believe it was at the library. So after I'm done, the people come over, and this gal comes up, and she's standing in front of me, and she's crying. And she said, uh, can I give you a hug? Now, being single, of course, I never turned down a hug. So I said, well, of course. She gives me a hug and she goes, you just changed my life. And that's a very, very powerful thing to hear. I don't think I change anybody's life. I give them the vehicles and maybe the, the uh, ability to do it themselves. But it's still very powerful to hear. 
And then I had a bunch of people that were buying books and it was just really great. And then she said, I want to get a couple of journals and I have a son. And it was just the neatest thing. And I got back in the car. And two things occurred to me. If you ever wonder who you're closest with in your life, who's the first person you call with the best or the worst news? That's how you know. So for me, I was so thrilled. I wanted to call Connor. But then I thought, nope, I'm just going to drive along. And I realized now I was a nine. I'd gone from a two to a six to a nine. No drinking, no smoking, no drugs, no artificial stimulation. Just writing in my gratitude journal and helping some people and making a difference in this woman Janice's life. And as I drove back home, I just had this big smile on my face. And after working for Lowe's and some of the frustration of some of those goofball corporations, excuse me, um, I usually always, I never call it by name, I say the opposite of hi and not Home Depot, but anyway. But I took the rear view mirror and I just looked at myself and I went, I'm so proud of you for trying to make a difference. Because that's what I'm trying to do. But when you, when you have it and you get something you're excited about, you want to share it. So I learned how to fly a lot of years ago. And I was flying down by ocean shores and all of a sudden I got in between cloud layers. And you're not supposed to be there because I was a VFR pilot, visual flight rules. But all of a sudden the sun comes in and hits these clouds and it's like this incredible colors of kale a kaleidoscope is coming at me. I'm going maybe 150 knots and I'm just hanging on to the yoke. I'm just like, my eyes are like this, holy oh cow. And, and it's just coming above and below and it was just unbelievable. I've never seen colors like this. And then bang, I pop out of it and I'm out over the ocean and there's the ocean and the sand and the sun's coming in there. And I turned to my right and I went, isn't that the most incredible color? Did you see those blues, the green, the red, the way that silver came? It was unbelievable. And I went, oh, I was flying by myself. <laughs> and nobody ever got to see that except me. And it really bothered me. So when you think about your life, embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes. Don't ever give up. Get a gratitude journal and then share it. But also remember too, when you go get back in those cars tonight, windshield's about two feet by about four feet. It's pretty big. You ever notice the rear view mirror's about like this? So kind of keep that in proportion. Now the other day I saw some blue lights in the rear view mirror. That was different. I was for speeding, but, but just understand, you mostly want to focus. Learn from behind what's happened to you behind, but don't make it any more of a proportion than the rear view mirror and a windshield. And just take my word for it. If you give it a chance, it can change your life. It can transform your life. And in my, in my particular case, I fully, fully believe it saved my life. And it can save you guys as too. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You know, uh, one of the things that I, I will attest to is the gratitude journal for myself personally. I had a couple of hills and valleys along the way. And uh, the first time I did it, I was in a valley. And 